Thank you very much, Michael. We, uh, we appreciate it. It's a pleasure to, to see everybody uh, today, and, and most importantly for me, it's a pleasure to see a, a former colleague, Dr. Burgess, uh, who a lot of us would go to for uh, information and, and advice on bills and legislation. And he's been invited today to talk about a little bit uh, about how the healthcare world has <laughs> changed uh, in a relatively short period of time from when he began practicing uh, as a physician a couple of years ago. And uh, I think because we're talking about uh, IT, uh, let's just dive right into sure. it and, and talk about uh, what it has meant to uh, physicians from your uh, vantage point with the change in IT. I need to warn you, I'm wearing a wire. <laughs> Understood. So, well... You know, Affordable Care Act passed 10 years ago. In fact, March will be the 10-year anniversary. But one of the things we forget is that last year at this time was the 10-year anniversary for a bill called the Stimulus Bill. That was the AARA, which actually contained the language that ended up becoming the, uh, the appropriation for putting computer terminals in doctor's offices. And when I talk to groups of physicians, I mean, that, that one thing, talk about something that's transformative and maybe not in a good direction. There was a doctor I talked to in Iowa one day. He said, I you know, just remember it so well. And the next thing I know, I'm no longer a doctor. I'm a data entry clerk. So the technology that was available and, and to some degree is still available is, is not strictly user-friendly as far as physicians are concerned. And we've all had the experience. We go and see our doctor, and next thing they do is turn their back to you and start typing into a keypad. Well, I mean, I was always taught, look at your patient. You evaluate. Uh, the evaluation is sort of ongoing the, the entire time you're, you're there having that doctor-patient encounter. So it did put a, a, an additional layer in there that many, uh, many practicing physicians weren't ready for. On the plus side, uh, We've all got bad handwriting, uh, the ability to get a medical record from one place to the other. I mean, I did my residency at Parkland Hospital. There was nothing worse than 10, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, a patient comes in. She's been going to our Parkland outpatient clinics at one of the remote facilities, and they bring the literally physically cart the charts up there every night, bring them up the elevator, and you go in to retrieve her chart, and it's not there because it's probably on someone's desk back in the clinic, which is locked up, and no one can get it for you. So that's a problem. And now with electronic health records, of course, that problem doesn't exist anymore. So are there positives? For sure, there are positives. Um, and then, of course, one of the big things we're grappling with and, and will continue to grapple with, I suspect, for some time, are, are the whole issues around privacy and the um, fact that different states are coming up with different privacy regimens that um, then other states question, do I have to follow that or can we do our own thing or is there going to be a federal standard that's imposed at some point? So before I make that investment, before I, before I do that uh, time and training, are, are you going to do something at the federal level? And that's something that sort of defied um, any effort at compromise for, for some time. The, uh, the whole issue around, around privacy is, is one that, well, even before the, uh, uh, the stimulus bill passed, that was the, one of the one stumbling blocks to even getting to a place where you could have electronic health records. In fact, uh, Ron Johnson, who was the head of Aetna, in health insurance in 2007, I heard him give a talk, and he said, we're the, we're, you think of us as a health insurance company, we're actually a software company. We're like the second largest software company in the country. Uh, and I asked him afterwards, I said, well, what do you need from, from us as, as policymakers? What would you need from us to make things work? And he said, well, we're going to need some regulatory relief on the Stark Law. We're going to need some liability protection uh, because we can't just be getting sued every time we turn around. And you've got to decide what you mean by privacy and not change your mind every three months. So unfortunately, those three conditions are still out there and haven't been met. Stark Law still exists, even though Pete Stark, rest his soul, is no longer with us, but the Stark Law is. And the uh, uh, question of liability is one that has not been resolved, but privacy remains the big, the big obstacle. One of the things uh, that we battle with all the time, and I know you still do uh, on, the, on the committee, and, and that is 
what is the role of, of government in technology innovation? You know, does the, does the government step out of the way and let the private sector do it? Do we help drive it? You know, what, what's the role? Well, the answer is both, obviously. And we are, you know, we're blessed in this country. We're like the engine of innovation for the world in, in, in many instances. Uh, still, is there a place for a regulatory touch, albeit a light regulatory touch? And, and the answer is yes. The, uh, all the hearings we had around, you know, as, as medical apps and health apps be started to become a thing a few years ago, and then there was concern. Is the Food and Drug Administration going to actually interpose its regimen on these development of these electronic apps? There was a decision made that the FDA would sort of take a, a hands-off approach and monitor the situation. I think that's been good. I think that's been helpful. I think that has allowed the, the, the health monitor apps to, to continue to be developed. I mean, I've got an EKG on my iPhone. That's, uh, that's great. I didn't, when I was in practice, I didn't, didn't know that would even be possible, but it is today. And, and again, the FDA was pretty straight, straightforward in allowing that. To, they actually evaluated that as a predicate device. EKGs were already allowed. <clears throat> so the fact that you could carry one on your, in, your, uh, in your pocket or in your belt holster was, uh, while it was a novel concept, the, uh, the technology itself really wasn't all that novel. As we look at, at uh, artificial intelligence now and, and the growth of it, certainly in the, in the medical field, uh, you have a lot of people that still say, you know, they, they want a human being making that decision. So from, a, from an ethical standpoint, you know, how, how does Congress make sure that AI, AI uh, is being used in appropriate ways? Well, and that is a tall order, and it is so important um, I think of a disease like uh, type 1 diabetes, and it is one that lends itself to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is part of one of the, one of the principal management tools. Uh, you might even ask the question, why would you want a person involved in that? Uh, it really, it's a minute-by-minute -minute protocol, and artificial intelligence is probably better suited to deliver that because you're not going to have your doctor monitoring your glucose literally minute-by-minute minute all through the day and night. Um, surely there are, and there are, you know, things we haven't even thought of that could be problems. And uh, clearly the policymaker will have to still be involved and there will have to be uh, various evaluations. My concern is always, I don't want to, you know, I want the technology. I, if there's a better way to handle type 1 diabetes and we've got all of the tools and technology today, then let's do it. Let's get it to people. The creation of the artificial pancreas, uh, which is really nothing more than a continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump, and they communicate with each other, uh, that took forever to get that through the FDA. And, and, and why? I mean, these technologies were not, were not that new, but it was the combining of them that seemed to be the stumbling block at the agency. So I recognize that the regulatory agencies can be problematic at the same time, and, and certainly vis-a-vis -vis the problems with privacy and the problems with hacking. You certainly don't want someone hacking into your insulin pump. That could be, uh, well, I guess <laughs> Dick Cheney was the one who, uh, you remember uh, when he was on a stage and <laughs> he had a pacemaker in or something and someone who could hack into his pacemaker could create all kinds of international havoc. So you do have to be careful, obviously, with, uh, with that aspect of regulation. Can I just share with you, on Friday I had two classified briefings. Um, one was on the, uh, the problem with cybersecurity and the issues surrounding cybersecurity. It was more in the uh, uh, delivering electricity to customers in, in that space rather than the healthcare space. But still, it was it, it, some of the things they were talking about were very concerning. And then the other hearing I had, or classified briefing I had, was on the coronavirus. And I honestly can't tell you which one scared me more, but I'll just share with you. <laughs> they both scared me. I mean, there, there are significant things, significant risks out there in the world. And it's, uh, as, as someone, and you know this because you were there, I mean, someone who sits as a policymaker in Washington, D.C., that concerns me. There are going to be all of different types of, of situations that require our response. And you just pray that you always make the right one. And I think the, you know, the most important thing on the, the coronavirus is making sure that we are able, the United States, to stay ahead 
of what's going on. And, and I know, are, are you having weekly updates and or, or briefings, or how how are you being informed? It's that hasn't been structural, but it's what's evolved. And I think that's appropriate. The, I mean, in the past two weeks, we went from less than 100 deaths to over 1,000 in, in, again, less than 14 days' time. Case rate was under 7,000 uh, t- 10 days ago, and it's uh, in excess of 30,000 now. I mean, it's, it is clearly a very rapidly evolving situation. I think China made the right decision uh, to quarantine an entire city of 10 million people. And that's pretty startling when you stop and think about it. it. And it's a city of 10 million people that nobody knew existed. That was startling also. Um, but the downside of that is there's also an information blackout. So no one really is reporting what's happening at the street level. And uh, I mean, this, I'm like the rest of you, I see stuff on blogs and Twitter uh, of things that sound pretty desperate. Um, and that concerns me that the, the flow of information is not coming back to us. I think, if I understand correctly, the World Health Organization has finally been allowed to, uh, to participate in what's going on over there. And I think that's a good thing. And I know there are great people at our CDC that in a heartbeat would be on a plane over there. And that's, if they're allowed. Yeah, if they're allowed. But they, they want to do They just just as we can do, uh, the uh, DR Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, with the Ebola uh, crisis that was there. I mean, the keeping up the public health people, e- even when you would be to your benefit, that's something that I, I just don't understand. And I will tell you, I also don't understand someone at the CDC says, yeah, send me into that Ebola area. Send me into that coronavirus area. Um, you got to love people like that that are willing to put, literally put themselves in peril in order to do their job, which they see as as benefiting all of the rest of us. That's that's really a a different type of individual who can do those jobs. We've just got a a couple of minutes left, and and I do want to say thank you to the congressman because he he was able to wedge uh, (laughs) this in uh, to a speech with AMA, and he's got, I guess, an autonomous vehicle hearing coming up uh, in just a few minutes. Yeah, I've got a self-driving car waiting for me out here. (laughs) Does your staff know that? Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, so the, I guess one of the things that I want you to talk a little bit about, you hear about caucuses all the time on the Hill, mm-hmm. this caucus, that caucus. But there is a health IT caucus uh, and on, on the Hill, and they do good work in providing mm-hmm. information to, to the members. Can you talk a little bit to, to this audience about what a caucus's uh, use is and how important it is? Well, first off, um, when you're in the minority, the caucus becomes extremely useful because as a member of the minority party in Congress, I don't get to set the hearings. I don't get to call the witnesses. Uh, You're just doing whatever is dictated by the majority. But in a caucus environment, you actually can set up a roundtable or briefing. Correct, it doesn't have quite the same impact as as a congressional hearing. There's not an official transcript. But you can get a lot of information to members in in, uh, pretty efficiently through the, through the caucus method. And I used that a lot in the years when we were in the minority before, uh, 2007 to 2011, um, to, to be able to update people on various aspects of health policy. I will say this also, and I, I, when I was the chairman of the health subcommittee, the, the last hearing that I did as chairman in December of 2018 was get Dr. Rucker to come in and talk to us about this proposed rule that he had uh, come up with and was sending down to the Office of Management of the Budget to get the approval to to release it for for comment. It's now, as you know, out there for comment. But we should, my opinion, we as the Committee of Jurisdiction should do a lot more of that. We haven't done much this year at all with, uh, with what's going on at the Office of National Coordinator of Health Information Technology. And, and we should, because it's, it is our jurisdiction and it affects literally everyone in the country. Well, I, I just want to say thank you again for, for wedging us in. The, the seconds are ticking off. I think it's important uh, that everybody understand. This, this is a guy that, you know, was a physician, an OBGYN, 
uh, that had no desire to, to or, or sight set on being a member of Congress, and the opportunity presented himself, he stepped forward and his constituents uh, elected him to come to Congress. And he is exactly, I think, what the founders of this country wanted, and that is somebody that that wasn't a, a career politician, that, that worked in the field, that understood uh, what he was doing. He's brought a lot of expertise, and I want to say thank you very much for what you do on the Hill, and thanks for coming here this morning. No, you're very kind, Jeff. I used to make fun of people like me, and you know now I, now I recognize that it is an important <laughs> role we play. But uh, thank you all very much. I, I, I appreciate you letting me be here. You had a panel of experts here just a few minutes ago, and then you had me, so kind of balanced out the morning. <laughs> Expert, non-expert. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff.